Hello, this is Janet Michael. In addition to hosting The Valley today each weekday at noon on the River 95.3, I also produce podcasts, and I'm excited to introduce you to a new podcast series in partnership with Lord Fairfax Community College. Having provided higher education and career training for the past half century, LFCC is tightly interwoven into the fabric of the Northern Shenandoah Valley and Piedmont regions. Join me every week for conversations with current and former students to hear their funny and inspiring stories as we learn about their journey to higher education, the role that LFCC has played, where they are now, and where they plan to go. We'll also talk to current and former professors about their experiences and best memories of LFCC over the past 50 years. Get every single episode as they're released on our website at theriver953.com under the podcast tab, or you can subscribe for free in Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, on Spotify, Amazon Music, wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for LFCC Stories. Hello and welcome to the Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. Happy Friday as you are listening to the show today. It is Extension Office Friday and we are going to get your finances in order today. Karen Poff is joining me on the screen. We are, of course, pre-recording our conversation. And Karen, we're going to talk about Quick Money Chats, which is a new program that you are offering through the Extension Office Give me uh, a, an overview of what your position is at the Extension Office and how Quick Money Chats play into that. Well, I am the Extension Agent for Family and Consumer Sciences, which is a big, long title. But basically, it means that I teach people how to manage their money. And we have this program that helps people to get their money questions answered. And you and I have talked on the show before about how people don't necessarily know where to go to get their money questions answered because do you want to be having the car salesman teach you how to buy a car or do you want to be having the investment advisor teach you about investments? Yes, you want them to provide advice, but don't you want to know a little bit before you go in there to talk to them so that you know you're getting the straight answer and they're not maybe putting something into a suggestion that's more in their self-interest than yours. So just to be a good informed consumer when you're dealing with all kinds of different professionals. So we created this quick money chats question because people may not wanna come to a six session series or even a two hour workshop when they think what they have is really a quick question. So people can go to this link and sign up. It's a very brief, questionnaire is basically just their contact information, what their question is, and what times they're available. And then we will contact them back for a virtual chat to provide the answer to their question or connect them to the right place to get their question answered. And it's all confidential. This isn't something that a bunch of people have access to who's asking questions about what or anything like that. No, absolutely not. Uh, the, The information is confidential, although the survey does come to me by email. So you shouldn't put anything in there like your social security number or account numbers or anything, but it comes directly to me. And then the only other person that might see the information would be the volunteer who might be calling back to respond to your question, depending on you know who might be doing that. But it's, it's totally confidential and we don't share the information with anybody else. I would imagine that these questions that you are asked probably run the gamut from some pretty standard basic things to things that maybe you and your volunteers can't answer and have to guide them or point them in a different resource. Definitely. I mean, there are sometimes sometimes legal questions that people have. They may not think it's a legal question, but then we can see the complexity of it and see that they need more help, or maybe they have uh, something that's really complex. And there's a difference between providing the education, which is what we do, and providing advice. So we don't provide financial advice. We're not going to say, here's the five options, and this one is the best one. We're going to say, here's the five options, and here's the pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages of each one. And then you still get to make a decision, but it's a more informed decision because you're now educated about that question. And you're not going to give legal advice either, just just like you wouldn't give financial advice. Absolutely. But we will help connect you with legal resources and 
you know, just like anything else, if, if I work in this financial field, and especially I work in this northern Shenandoah Valley area, I know what resources are available, what agencies and organizations are available. And so when people call us, even if we don't have the answer, I probably know locally where they can go to get that information and how to go about finding, even if it's something like they're looking for a, a bank account and they need a, a financial institution. Again, we're not going to recommend a particular one, but I'm going to be able to give them the tools of here's the kinds of questions you want to ask. Here's some advantages and disadvantages of different uh, considerations that you might want to include. And it's going to be more tailored to their situation and our area. I think we talked the last time we were having a conversation about these quick money chats that Google may always have the answers, but it doesn't mean it's the answer for you. (laughs) Right. And they don't know what organizations and agencies are available in our area to help. They don't know Virginia law. They might be giving you the answer that's correct, but it's California's answer. And that's not going to, it may actually harm you in the long run because Virginia law may be different. I think that's really, it's really helpful to consult a local free confidential resource that's unbiased and trustworthy and coming to you from your land grant universities. I would imagine that if you're offering quick money chats, probably one of the most popular questions that you're going to get asked or most frequently asked questions is going to be, how do I get a free copy of my credit score? That is true. And people ask about the report thinking they're going to get a score with it a lot of times. And the credit score does not come with your free credit report. So people need to think about If they really want to know that number and that's really important to them, then there are several different ways to get it. Again, you and I have talked before on this show about one of those ways, which is from a credit score service, a free credit score service. One of the ones we've talked about is Credit Karma. There are others. We've also talked again about you are the product when you're getting a score from a free service like that. So They may be giving you that free service, but they are trying to sell you something, whether it's a new loan or whether selling your information or whatever is happening. So that is one option, but people don't realize there are other options. I've got four different possibilities for you, and that's only one of them. Another option is to check with your lender, whoever that might be. The person that called in recently to ask this question actually was able to then go to her credit union. She had her car loaned through them. They were able to give her a copy of the score as well as some suggestions for improvement for the future. There's free financial information right there at the the lender that you're already dealing with. Many, many um, credit card companies now are doing that. You can actually just, when you log into your site, you can look on see my credit score and go there to find your score. So that's that's a second option. Another one that people may not realize is a nonprofit credit or housing counselor. So if you go to a credit counselor or a housing counselor, many of them have the ability to pull your credit report and score for you and go over that with you and give you some ideas about how to improve it. And then the final one is directly from the credit bureau or myfico.com. So both of those options are getting it directly from the credit source. And there is a a small cost, might be $15 for one score or something like that, but it's not an ongoing cost. And just make sure if you do that, you don't sign up for any extra (laughs) services that they're trying to offer you. But as a one-time thing, it's not really expensive to actually buy the score. And again, you'll get some recommendations. They see your credit file. They can give you some ideas about how to improve that score as well. So four different options that people have when they really thought they had to go to that free place. That was the only way to get it free. Is there any such thing as a good credit score? Is it a range? How do those things work? There is a range. And here's another good question. If someone wanted to call in for a money chat, I'd be glad to answer that for them. There is a range around 350, although I've never seen one quite that low, up to about 850. But there are many different credit scores. So that's actually a really in-depth topic that we might want to talk about another time. But generally, if you're over maybe 700 or so, then you're going to be in pretty good shape. But that is with the FICO 8 score. And realize there are many different kinds of scores. So you can't just use that. You have to know 
which score you're using and what type of credit you're applying for to know whether you have a good score for that particular circumstance. I think we should do a whole show on credit scores and credit reports because I've read somewhere that now you can include paying your electric bill and your cable bill on time at, to help improve your credit and that sort of stuff. We need to do a whole show on credit. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'd love to do that. And right now with housing prices, the way they are, a lot of people are thinking about refinancing. Is that something that you can help people with? It is. And the person that called recently to ask this question Actually, I really like these kinds of situations because she didn't have a problem yet. She was calling in advance to say, hey, teach me about how to refinance so that I do it right and don't get into a problem. And that is awesome. So I had lots of thoughts for her. One is to figure out your break-even point. And we have a great worksheet for that. So what you want to find out is, if you refinance, of course, you've got closing costs and things like that. You may have to pay points depending on the situation. So how long are you going to have to stay in the house to break even? If your break even point is five years from now and you plan to stay in the house six or seven more years, then it's beneficial to refinance. If you're only going to be in the house four more years, then refinancing isn't necessarily a good option. So that worksheet is great for people. Another thing that I always, I think I mention at every show is the rule of three. You don't go to just one place to investigate a, a loan or a mortgage. You want to compare at least three different options. And we have a great handout about that that has a long list of questions that you can ask. It tells you exactly what kinds of questions you need to ask to compare your different options appropriately and make sure that you get all of the good information about that. That would be my biggest fear is because I would think, oh, I'm going to refinance. So I'm just going to go with the person that gives me the lowest monthly payment after my refi, because that's in the top of my mind, I'm thinking means it's a good deal, but that may not necessarily be the good deal long-term. Absolutely. And that loan actually can cost you more in the long run, even though it's got the low payment. So you're, you're right on target there. And another thing that's related is that a lot of institutions will advertise no closing costs. So just realize that even if they're advertising no closing costs, it doesn't mean that there aren't any closing costs. What it means is that the closing costs are rolled into the cost of the loan. Well, that's all well and good. It means you don't have to put any money out now, but what's happening is you are now paying interest on those closing costs for this loan of 15 plus years. So you're actually paying way more than if you can pay the closing costs right up front. So another thing to consider. And there are options. You can say, no, I'd rather not do that. Tell me what my closing costs are and I want to pay you for them now. You're not stuck in any one of these situations most of the time. Exactly. Knowing what questions to ask. That's really the big thing. When you're talking with a lender, you need to educate yourself about the, the topic before you go in. Another thing that people haven't thought about, especially recently, is that if your equity in your home is more than 20%, you may be able to avoid paying private mortgage insurance. So maybe you've been paying private mortgage insurance on this loan, PMI for short. You've been paying this on your, your loan in the past, and you haven't gotten up to 20% equity, but with the housing prices so high, an appraisal may get you over that 20% equity, and you may be able to be able to refinance without that PMI. And another thing that I always just remind people is an adjustable rate mortgages seem very enticing because their rates are lower than they are for a fixed rate mortgage. But realize that rates are so low right now, they are likely to go up from here. So you want to think carefully about an adjustable rate mortgage if you want to make sure that you're getting a low interest rate and keeping it low for the life of your loan, then you want to look for a fixed rate. And that makes and sense. Logic tells you that if it's adjustable and you're going in now at a really low rate, they never stay low. At some point, they're going to be high, if not higher than the rate you've got now. So it does kind of make sense. But I think sometimes in the moment, we're not thinking about these things. Right. 
And a couple other things just that we can actually put in the notes. There's a great Federal Trade Commission website called Shopping for a Mortgage that has lots of good information. And I also found for this person that called in an interactive interest rate chart. It's on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau website. You can go on this website. You can check Virginia. And if you do know your credit score, you can use the little slider button that will show you interest rates in Virginia and like averages that are, are being charged right now, the current rates for the various credit score levels. So it gives you, again, a good idea before you go in to talk to the lender, hey, I should be able to qualify for something around this level. And if it's way higher than that, then you know, mm, something might not be kosher. Can we answer some more questions in the next segment? That would be fantastic. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Karen Poff. She is a senior extension agent in the Family and Consumer Sciences Division of the Virginia Cooperative Extension. She is based in Warren County, but serves all five surrounding counties. We are talking about their program, Quick Money Chats. We're going to have more questions answered from Karen when we come back in just a couple of minutes. Hello, this is Janet Michael. In addition to hosting The Valley today each weekday at noon on the River 95.3, I also produce podcasts. And I'm excited to kick off season two of our podcast series in partnership with Rappahannock Electric Cooperative called We Are REC. Every month we'll release a new episode talking to different people from REC about a host of different topics. We'll get tips for saving money on your electric bill. We'll talk about renewable energy and the impact it can have in our communities. We'll get some behind the scenes info about what happens when the power goes out in a storm. Don't miss out on information about community grants, scholarships, REC hosted events, and more. Get every single episode on our website at theriver953.com under the podcast tab, or you can subscribe for free in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, just search for We Are REC. Welcome back to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. Happy Friday. As you are listening to the show today, it is Extension Office Friday, and we are getting some money questions answered. Karen Poff is pre recording with me today. She is a senior extension agent in the Family and Consumer Sciences Division of Virginia Cooperative Extension. She is based out of Warren County. She serves all five of our surrounding counties. Karen, we talked in the first segment about this quick money chats program that is relatively new. I mean, you've been doing it for a few months now, so you very generously sent me some of the questions you've been getting asked to give people an idea of what kinds of questions you could answer. The next one up on the list is, if I have some disposable income, extra disposable income, should I pay down debt with it or should I invest it? Which is a really good question that I want to know the answer to. And I think it's a very common question because people want to do the right thing. They want to do the thing that's going to get the most bang for their buck. And it's not always easy. The main thing to consider is the interest rate of the debt you're considering paying down versus the amount of money you think you could earn by investing. And, and that is tricky because it's hard to know how much money you could earn by investing. But if you estimate that you could earn 10%, let's say, by investing in a mutual fund, then you would compare that amount to the amount of interest you're paying on the debt. If it's a credit card at 23%, then of course that would be better than investing the money. But if it's a mortgage at 3.5%, then investing the money might make more sense because you're gonna earn more than you're paying. So that sounds really simple and easy, but it's not always that easy because a lot of times there are tax implications that people need to think about. It may be a case where if you want to be real specific, you want to get more professional advice about it, like talk to your CPA, talk to your, your tax advisor. But in general, if you can itemize the mortgage interest on your taxes, and that would be the, the debt that you're paying down, then that actually costs you less than the interest rate that you're paying. Or on the other hand, if you're investing in something through your employer's plan, and you're paying with pre-tax dollars, you might actually be earning more than just the interest rate that you think you're, you're going to make. And so, there could be a match. So if you're doing that through an employer plan and they're matching, you kind of have to count that in too, I would guess. 
Absolutely. And especially if your employer is matching 100%. If you put in at 1% and they put in 1%, you've got a 100% return on that investment. Well, if you're paying down debt, that's 23%. Do you want 100% return or 23% return? <laughs> Unless the debt is a problem for you. In some cases, the debt is really a burden, then it might make more, more sense to pay it down, even if you would earn more investing. But the, we're assuming in this case, it's just a flat, which should I do without the complexity of this debt is killing me. It, another consideration is really what is important to you. So it's not just about the dollars, even though we can maybe easily calculate how much we're going to save or make, then it's about your comfort level, your comfort level with that debt, like we were talking about, your comfort level with investing risk. How much risk are you going to have to take to earn that 10% on that investment? And are you going to be able to sleep at night if the market's going down? And the main thing is not sell it while it's down. If your investments have to be more conservative for you to be comfortable, then that might not be a 10% interest rate that you're earning. It might be a 5% interest rate. So that's something to think about. And your future goals and your values. What is important to you? What things are you trying to accomplish? If getting out of debt is a high priority goal for you, then that might be the better option, regardless of how much you could make investing it. So that's important, your goals and values. Then people often don't think about a third possibility because they're just thinking the either or, but an option is to split the difference. So you have a hundred extra dollars. And because there's not an obvious solution and you're having a hard time deciding because it's kind of close, then $50 toward the debt, $50 toward investing is another option. And that can work well for people. What we're here for is to help you think through the options. And for many people who are calling, just having somebody to talk through it with, then they're able to easily figure out this is the best thing for me to do on their own. I can imagine the number of people who reach out with a question like, what should I do? Should I pay this down or should I invest that are thinking they're going to get an answer back that says you should invest. And instead it's, well, that depends. Where are you in this part of your life? What, what are your priorities and goals here? And it really does become this educational conversation that they walk away feeling so much smarter and so much more at ease with making whatever that decision ultimately is. Definitely. And I think another thing, I mean, this, this goes back to the resources we have available. There are some great websites out there that have financial calculators on them. So if the person is unsure because they're not good at the math. Now, again, we're not going to go and do the math for them necessarily, but we can point them to a place. I mean, there's calculators right out there that pay down debt or invest and you put in all your numbers and they have the taxes considerations in there and you put it all in and it can give you that dollar answer, which isn't always the answer you end up choosing, but it does give you more information. But if somebody then follows that up with, well, where do you recommend that I invest? What is your answer then? Well, we have had that question. And again, there's some questions that we, re we really are an unbiased source of information. And with investing, because we're not licensed, we're not registered investment advisors, we can't give people advice. We can't legally give people advice on investing. We can educate people about investing. We can talk to you about what diversification means or why it's good to dollar cost average and, and those sorts of concepts that it's good for you to know when you go to talk to the investment professional, but we can't specifically make recommendations. But for people who have called with that type of question, again, we have lots of resources. We can give them information about how to select an investment advisor. We can give them information about, we talked about last time, what all those letters after the people's <laughs> names mean and how to research whether they've had any disciplinary action or not, where to go to look and see if there are any complaints against this person before you deal with them. So lots of great, excellent information even when it's a question that we're not allowed to give the answer specifically to. And I would guess that you probably are somewhere split, maybe down the middle between ones that you can say, here's the information that you need to make a good decision and 
we need to tell you to go check this out before we can do any kind of further consultations? I think that's a good estimate. Probably about half of the people we can help without referring to other resources and probably the other half, we need to give them good information, but there hasn't been anybody who's called and we've said, I have no idea. I don't have, I don't have any information for you. There's always a place that we can refer them to or good resources on the web that are credible and unbiased that we can refer people to, to get their answer. So the next question is one of those that when I was looking over this list during the break, we were talking about this and I'm like, oh, I wouldn't ask you this question because I already have the answer. And as it turned out, my answer would have been wrong. So this is another great educational tool to tell people, even if you think you know the answer to something, it never hurts to ask just to be on the safe side. So the question is, I am in a later life marriage and my husband wants to add me to the deed on his home, but not add me to the mortgage. What are the advantages and disadvantages of this? And I will say, I said, all in. Who wouldn't want a free house? And then you're like, wait a minute, Janet, there's more that you have to consider. Right. When you're dealing with something like this, especially the the key with this question is it's a later life marriage, especially. I mean, there may be some considerations for a younger couple, but especially in this situation, they may have had children from a previous marriage. Either one of them may have had children from a previous marriage. So it makes the situation more complex. So I was able to send them the chapter from the Virginia Code so that they could see exactly what it means to have tenancy by the entirety, which is what it would be if both spouses were on the deed. And what that means, it does provide some protections from creditors of either person but not complete protection in all situations. So you can't assume that because you have both people on the deed, there's no chance for creditors to attach the house. In most cases, there aren't. But again, that's a legal situation. Then on the other side, there's the mortgage. And who's going to be responsible for paying that if the husband dies and the wife is still alive and owns the house, but is not on the mortgage? Again, that's a legal question. What we did in this situation was, of course, provide the information on the Virginia Code and you know, provide the, the sources of information that they needed, but also refer them to an attorney. And one of the sources that I frequently refer people to is Virginia Lawyer Referral Service, because that is not income-based. People think about legal aid and they know about legal aid, but a lot of people think, well, I can't get legal help. If, if I'm not eligible for legal aid because I make too much money. But the Virginia Lawyer Referral Service is a service of the Virginia Bar, the state bar, and attorneys volunteer to be listed and you pay $35 for 30 minutes. It's 30 minutes of legal advice. And if they are your attorney for that 30 minutes, they're gonna give you real legal advice for that 30 minutes. And you can get a whole lot of questions answered in 30 minutes. If you, if you write them down and you don't go off on bunny trails and rabbit trails, you can get a whole lot of questions answered. So in this situation, if this couple were to go to the attorney and get the 30 minutes, they could not only talk about this particular issue, but is any estate planning needed if they have children from a previous marriage? What's the possibility that either of these things might be challenged And how can they set it up so that their wishes are honored in the future? At the end of that 30 minutes, there's no obligation, either on the client side or the attorney side. You can, either of you can walk away. If you continue, then the attorney would bill you at cost for whatever it is that needs to happen. If you want a trust created or whatever. And I will tell you, I have two friends that are attorneys. Well, actually one uh, graduated from being an attorney to being a judge now. So I can't ask her any legal questions. She's just (laughs) a regular friend again and not my best friend slash attorney. But I have another friend, Suzanne Herskowitz. I think you've met Suzanne Mm -hmm. who, let me tell you, in 30 minutes at lunch, I can get a lot of questions asked and answered of her uh, about estate planning, about all of these things. I'm like, okay, what about this? And should I do this? And how would this work? And you'd be amazed. You're right at what you can get information about in 30 minutes. And and it's a great service. And I don't want people to think that this is something that has to be virtual or just over the phone. It's an attorney in your area. You call, you give them the zip code, 
and you give them the area of law. If you need to do a real estate transaction or if this is a divorce or whatever, they find someone that specializes in that topic in your area. So you can have that in person, at least outside of COVID time, <laughs> in person <laughs> appointment with, with an attorney that's local and can give you really good information. So we started with a credit question. So let's wrap up with a a credit question. Can you review my credit report to help me figure out what I need to do to improve my credit score? And the answer to that is yes. If we're looking at the report together, again, we're not going to give you advice, but if we're looking at the report together, we can identify here are accounts that dealing with these or fixing these issues may help your credit score. And we can show someone, here's how to dispute this information. Maybe they say this account is not mine when we go through the report together and those sorts of things. We can help people understand, again, we need that half hour show about credit, you know, what affects their credit score. There are five different parts of the score. And the information that's in the report is what's used to create that score. So if we get the credit report to best reflect accurately your uh, responsibility of using credit, then your score can improve over time. And sometimes it's just a matter of paying off a small debt. I had somebody one time that it was like a $35 debt, but had not been paid for a long time because this person didn't know it was on there. They had moved and never got a bill and never checked their credit report. And now they find out, well, if they just pay that off, that's going to instantly improve their credit score. It's going to take time for it to go up higher and higher, but right away when you pay it, it's going to improve some. As soon as we wrap up the show, we're going to pick a date and you're going to come back and we're going to do a whole show on credit because I have credit questions. (laughs) That would be fantastic. I really am looking forward to it. We're going to see how many you can answer in 30 minutes in another show. (laughs) I'll do my best. (laughs) But thank you for this. And the link where people can get all of the information for the quick money chat so they can get this process started for them. You'll send that to me and I'll put it in the show notes page. Yes. And some of the other resources that we talked about as well. Fantastic. Well, Karen, thank you. I appreciate it. It was great being here. Thanks for having me. We are going to wrap up our conversation today with Karen Poff. She is a senior extension agent with Family and Consumer Sciences. We have been talking about some of the questions that you can get answers to, similar questions in their quick money chats. It is a new program. Links, as we just mentioned, will be in the show notes page. Just head over to the river953.com and click on the podcast tab. Get out. Have a great weekend. It is Father's Day weekend. My kid is coming home. I am so excited. He never comes home for Mother's Day because baseball season is still happening in Mother's Day. But he is coming home for Father's Day and I am over the moon. So make sure you take a minute and give a shout out to your dad, to your granddad, to somebody who was like a dad, to your mom who could have been also your dad because, you know, a lot of moms are filling a lot of roles these days. I'll meet you back here on Monday. I'll have a brand new episode of The Valley today ready to go for you just a few minutes after noon.